Welcome to Infinity Rewatch, and as the Rod Stewart song goes, we all saw you tonight on a downtown train. Uh, but this train was not bound for any station. It was uh, bound just for chaos and mischief, because that's the name of the game. I'm Andrew Fantasia. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Ryan J. Whitehead. And this is Loki Episode 3. Now, here's a quick prologue before we get into Loki Episode 3. Uh, I wanted to save this for the podcast, Ryan, because I wanted to record your face just in case you haven't heard what I'm about to tell you yet. Because you, there's a chance you may have already heard this. But did you hear all the news that just dropped about Transformers? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I am both I am both very excited but also scared as hell. Well, there's of what this monstrosity might be. There's no bay. So, he's gone. He won't hurt us anymore. Um but all this talk of of the the beasties and my favorite Rhinox and Optimus Primal like when I heard this, I just thought of you. And I just thought of of those '90s years that that we we didn't know each other, but we were psychically <laughs> knowing each other. Uh, and I just thought, okay, Ryan is going to love this movie, hands down. So I'm excited. I'm excited for this Gen One Optimus truck that we're apparently getting. Uh, just as long as it's more like Bumblebee, which apparently it is, and less like you know everything else, we're golden. I actually haven't seen Bumblebee. Wow. To be honest with you. Yeah, no. I mean, to be fair, I've, I, I remember seeing Transformers with you guys. Mm -hmm. um, that was where the famous quote uh, came from the audience. The audience member where he's like, "I didn't enjoy the movie, but I enjoyed your reactions to the film." And truth be told, the the first film, ha the first film has historic value to us because. It was the first time we got to see our beloved Transformers on screen. Was it the best interpretation of it? Hell no, especially where we are today. I mean, it's it's come to a point now where when movies come out, um, you know, movies in the past, at the time, that's all we had. So it was a big deal. It was pretty exciting. Um, but we've come so far in in the the nerd culture of all of our favorite stuff. Um to this point where you know if you're gonna do it now it, it's it should be interesting and so from what you tell me uh my initial impression was i didn't do i didn't read the whole thing i just saw that the title was there and it, my immediate inter my immediate interpretation was oh no is michael bay producing it um so i was a bit nervous about that but now that you tell me he's not even part of it uh, i'm really excited i am genuinely excited for this uh because the beast Wars story was incredible and especially too, at first you're just like, what is this? Like, this is Transformers, but it's not what I'm used to. Um, and then they drop, like, they they tie the two stories together from, like, the, the, the Great War to, like, the events of Beast Wars. And I really, really hope that that's what they do with the movie. Because if they do that, oh my god, you could totally retcon the whole thing and just start from scratch and do this epic Beast War story that I would absolutely love and it would be perfect. So my friend, yes, I'm very excited uh, about that. Uh, you know, speaking of Transformers, can't go without saying G.I. Joe. Uh, and there was the trailer for Snake Eyes, uh, about Snake Eyes Origins. Um, I'm actually really excited for that as well. Um, you know, I, I'm a little concerned because the first thing they said was, oh, we've read the comic books. And again, don't tell me, show me <laughs> just do all the homework there <laughs> but that being said um it does look like they did borrow quite a bit from the comics so i'm very excited about that yeah yeah this um this origin story of snake eyes looks like it might actually be as a guy who knows zero about any of the g's or i's or joe's this looks like it's it's really starting to understand what makes this franchise appealing to people, right? Like it looks like it's it's ninjas. It's, it ninjas. Ninjas makes anything appeal. Yeah, it's just got that old fashioned comic pulpy charm. And I feel like the other mm -hmm. two movies, even though I enjoyed the second one, were really just trying to be like, let's be like the Transformers movie, so it's soldiers, but their names are Duke. Yeah. 
USA. Yeah. Uh, and it, it it failed to really capture that spirit. So I'm glad that these uh, that this looks like it's going the right way. And you will, I promise you, sir, you will uh, be a hundred percent charmed and enchanted by Bumblebee. That movie was mwah, fantastic. I, you know, I owe it to myself to to watch it. Um... Because, and, and I remember, and I think it was because it was the first one to detach itself from the, the original trilogy and just try to do something fresh uh, and, and give it a whole fresh polish. So I, I definitely need to see it. I remember hearing that the, the original Starscream is in it, um, which is like the old school jet, which I'd love to see. So yeah, yeah, no, definitely need to watch it, my friend. I will get on that. But uh, it's a great time to be alive for nerd content, let me tell you. Just so much, so much wonderful things going on. At first, I was always jealous of my older cousins uh, being all like, oh, man, you should have grown up in this time because it would have been a lot cooler. But to be fair, I'm glad I'm still young and hip enough to really enjoy what's going on right now. Because Marvel, baby, Marvel is just pumping out content. And I'm glad I'll be old enough to watch it all, man. I'm at the right age to enjoy this content. So... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm born where I should be born and I'm enjoying this content in the best way possible. Loki to, uh, getting into Loki, uh, this show, man, is everything I wanted in a comic book show experience overall. It's got lore, it's got fun. Um, and it, it really just kind of, one thing it does that, that Marvel does really well is it's, it's like a fun day in the life of the character. None of these scenes are very... None of these scenes make the story feel constructed in a disingenuous way. It just feels like a natural day in the life of this character, like the the, the little moments between. And that's what I love about these Disney Plus shows is is it does feel like a uh, an an actor's workshop on what this character did between the major moments. And I am all for it. It is the coolest thing. It's funny you say that, man, because I've just recently started uh, getting very attached to this really cool YouTuber uh, by the name of Patrick Willems, who is a, a filmmaking YouTuber. He always talks about movies and such. And he, he had a great little uh, piece that he talked about the MCU. And he said that he this was before Disney Plus was a thing. This was an older video. This was like 2016. And he was talking about how he enjoys the movies, but as a comic book reader, he said, it feels like the movies are missing the regular issues. He said, every movie feels like an event. Every movie feels like Civil War or Crisis on Infinite Earths. But the what made Civil War and Crisis so special was that they changed the status quo so that when you go back and you read, you know, Batman number 48, Batman's status quo has been changed because of something that happened in Crisis. And he said that that is the status quo is always changing in every Marvel movie, but because we never see in between the movies, we never see how that affects it. And again, he said this mm -hmm. in 2016, so there was no end game back then. It was very different, but I just think it's funny that you bring that up. This is a day in the life of Loki. This is Loki in his status quo. And even though he's been you know, ripped out of his time stream, we are starting to get these kinds of stories now uh, same with Star Wars. Like, what what are these stories we can tell when it's not about the war that is ripping the galaxy apart? And <laughs> we have some really cool corners of the universe that we get to look at, and really cool characters we get to meet. Absolutely, man. It's this is this is a fun ride. I I don't even know. I I see. It seems to me Marvel is really digging the buddy cop experience, and I think we talked about this on on a past podcast, but. Definitely, though they love the buddy cop journey story. Like I don't know how else to describe it. So it's it's a fun ride thus far. And so this episode in particular, it was shorter, uh, about right, ranging roughly around 40, 40 something minutes. Um, it was twelve minutes shy of its usual timestamp. Yeah, Foggy, um, what the hell, bra? <laughs> boycott, <laughs> boycott. Yeah, no, <laughs> never. I would sure. never put those two words in a sentence. Feige and boycott. I would never. What, what if it was like Feige saw a poor boy with nowhere to sleep, so he bought him a cot? 
I wouldn't use that either. <laughs> <laughs> um, but okay, so this episode, this ep- this particular episode, what I will say is it does feel this one actually feels like an event in a sense because at this point we got the big drop. We literally le- were left off with like you know the Lady Loki reveal. Which fun fact, by the way, guys, immediately at following this podcast um, or that podcast, I should say, I talked to my brother. Uh, the, a fellow, a fellow Marvel fanatic, and I can't believe of all the debating we did, we completely overlooked one of the biggest details. If you're going where I think you're going, yeah, we have to clarify this. Nick was on the ball a week ago, and as soon as this episode aired, it was so true to what Nick was saying that I almost forgot that he said that first. Like, because it was so like I'm watching, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's right, J- yeah. Just just like Nick is saying, wait, no, not like he's saying, like he said a week ago, this was uh, such a good call and such a huge oversight on our parts. We apologize. <laughs> so we had we had three of the four greatest minds of Marvel. I will say it. Three of the four greatest minds in Marvel. And we were all over this whole theory thing. And we thought we covered all the corners. And my brother, I text my brother after and he's like, yeah, I've been hearing these theories that Lady Loki's enchantress. Here's why. <laughs> Just mind blown. And so, first of all, she and 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 there's some big clues in the last episode, which brings us to the the transition here, uh, the segue, if you will, is that she does the reveal, but she also admits that she doesn't like to be called a variant. She doesn't want to be called the variant, and she doesn't obviously doesn't want to be called a Loki variant. So. Uh, that was the big, big clue number one. Big clue number two is she's using a power Loki doesn't have, which is the whole, uh, which is the whole enchantment thing. Mm-hmm. Which clue number three keeps using the word enchantment many a times, many a times. So then we get, then we're put into this episode, and this episode kind of starts off with the pacing I always like, which is just like you know getting right into the action, just get us into the big plan here. Um, and so, uh, we start off with, uh, what, what I will say for now is Lady Loki, um, slash Enchantress, uh, she just runs through the TVA trying to get to the whole thing. And the cool thing is too, is you see her trying to, trying to get C20, uh, C20's mind to figure out where the, the timekeepers are to which they, she finds out they're in a gold elevator going through the portal, Loki chase after her. And gotta say, as a fight as a, a fight guy in movies, I love these fight scenes. I mean, that actor, she can she can fight, man. Just she look, she makes fighting look so good. Just the hits, every hit has like a good umph moment that she seems to do to make the hits feel connected. Um, and one of my favorite moves she does is the whole flip kick, uh, which was really cool. Really using her body weight as like a weapon. Uh, and it's a great scene to kind of get us into the moment. But I loved, loved, loved the beginning of this episode. She fights like a boss. I was really digging their fight scene. Uh, and even, like, I think at one point later in the episode, it happened so fast, I couldn't tell. But it looks like she took off her tiara and used it as, like, a brass knuckle. Uh, did yeah. I see that right? You saw that too? Okay. She stabs him in the neck. She just goes for, straight for the jugular. <laughs> That's probably why one of the horns is broken. This ain't her first time pulling that move. And I also love the way that they portrayed her powers on screen. It, it was very uh, Scarlet Witch-esque. It was very, you know, creating this deep illusion with a deep, like, fake memory backstory to it of like, yeah, we've been best friends for a long time. Yeah. You love that drink. This is great. So how many people are guarding the timekeepers? Like it's, it's exactly the same kind of magic. And you guys brought up last week, how there's the green smoke when, when she does magic. And I totally forgot to even, you know, put that accessorize that with the red and the purple magic that we've seen in WandaVision. So all these pieces are fitting together. I I think that this says more than anything that this is really Enchantress that we're getting. Makes total sense. I mean, I've never seen a picture of Lady Loki, but I assume if she was just Loki as a lady, she'd be a brunette like Loki is. But this is a very blonde lady. 
and so is Enchantress. And Enchantress also wears the little horn things on her head. It's just, it's a great example of them taking a character and introducing her in a different way. Uh, just like they did with Ultron. Mm-hmm. You never lost who Ultron was. You just changed who made him. That's it. That's all, that's all you needed to change. And it doesn't really take anything away from him at the end of the day. So maybe mm-hmm. Enchantress mm-hmm. is in fact a variant in this canon. If she is, she's still a, an awesome character. She still gets the point of Enchantress across. And that doesn't mean we can't have great stories with her. Mm-hmm. It's funny though because you. It's funny the way you pitch that because it seems like, uh, according to like, I've been watching a lot of because I love he- hearing other comic book uh, masterminds talk about this stuff, and it seems like this enchantress could be a combination because apparently Hela in Thor Ragnarok was supposed to be a combination of enchantress and uh and hella oh. um but in my mind i i also like to agree with what the what the people are saying out there right now that it could be a lady loki and enchantress like it's just that kind of double the the duality of the character to kind of mesh into a good story to mesh this character into one so i i wouldn't be surprised the big clue here is that there is an enchantress and she does go by an alter ego name, Sylvie Lushton is is her full name. I like that. Yeah, and she calls herself Sylvie. Yeah. I'm assuming that's a play on the word Sylvan, S-Y-L-V-A-N, because that is a word in fantasy. And I don't know where it comes from. I know Magic the Gathering uses it. I don't know if they invented it. But mm-hmm. it's used to denote a certain type or certain culture of elf. Uh, so oh. it's like, oh, these are wood elves and these are sylvan elves. It might be a Dungeons and Dragons thing. It might just have come from magic. I don't know. But it, it's it's a, a very uh, high fantasy term. So that makes total sense that somebody from Asgard mm-hmm. would call themselves Sylvie when they go to Midgard and try to hide amongst us puny fleshy mortals. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's uh but th- but this Sylvie enchantress, she's like it's one of those things where she's like the second generation enchantress. She's not the 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 Amora the enchantress that that you and I would probably know and love. Um but yeah, it's she that's her kind of alter ego name. Um but uh it's it's a complicated Marvel history. Anyway, I really liked it. I'm banking that she is enchantress because I think that's what the people I think that's what people want to see. I mean, as much as I would love to see a Lady Loki, I think that I think the the Lady Loki aspect of it is kind of like the Easter egg, and then that she is Enchantress. Whereas some people might be thinking vice versa, is that she is Lady Loki, and there is the Enchantress Easter egg within her. So it's kind of that weird middle ground. Um, but uh, either way, I'm not angry about it. I, I, I will be happy no matter the outcome because it's a fun it's a fun ride. So they uh, they do the fight scene. It's a lot of fun. Um, and then they go to a new apocalypse apocalypse event and it's called the planet's called uh, Lum- Luminatis L- Luminatis. Uh, it's Lum- called Lamentus One. Lamentus One. Yes. And you know what that means, Ryan? It's time to play a game that we've only played here once. On the show, but we promised it was going to become an ongoing game. Uh, yes, and we started it way, way back in our Captain Marvel episode, and the game is called Galactus Hungers. And the rules are basically: every time we get a new planet, you and I have to guess what we think that planet tastes like. Because Galactus mm-hmm. eats planets. He's really mean. He does. He does. When Galactus calls, the hunger calls. <laughs> Um, shall, shall I go first or would you like to go first? I will go first. All right. I, I'm going to, I'm just going to take it right from you and I'm going to say, uh, it's going to taste like grapes. I had the same thought because of how, <laughs> how purple it is, but I added a little thing as well. Ooh. Um, because how the planet's about to be destroyed and everything's like, you know, fires raining from the sky, whatever. So, you know how, when you get a marshmallow, and you roast it until the outside is burned and crispy, but the inside is still soft and white and chewy. 
It's basically mm-hmm. that with a grape. Imagine roasting a grape cool. and on the outside, you've got just like this charcoal burn black crust. But on the inside, it's a juicy purple grape. That's the taste of Lamentus one. I like it. I like it. Um, well, fun fact. I mean, first of all, it begs the question, what causes this planet to collide with the other planet? Um, and so, well, it's a moon, actually. So what causes the moon to collide with this planet? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I will tell you that what I do know is Lamentis is actually on the edge of Cree space, is, uh, is its positioning. So that's something you need to know. Uh, what relevance does it have? I have no idea. Because here's the thing. The scrolls they never said in Captain Marvel what the scrolls were running from. They only said they were bullied by the Kree, and that's they're spread out all over the place, and that's it. So it is left of room for interpretation of you know, did Galact- in the story, Galactus ate the scroll planet, and they were promised a new place to go and do things. Go be scrolls, and therefore they're promised Earth, and they go to Earth because that's what they interpreted the prophecy as. So, I mean, is there any relevance with why this planet's falling apart? I don't think so. I don't think we're going to find out. I think it's just kind of the planet's falling apart, and that's unfortunate. Um, However, uh, I will say that Secret Wars was started by planets colliding with each other. So that's also something to be noted. So just, I think this apocalyptic event could foreshadow things. Um, This is not the first time we've seen a moon uh crash into a planet uh which is uh which is the battle we got in infinity war when thanos uh threw a moon at iron man uh so it's not the first time we saw it but i thought that was important to note don't you hate when you're trying to fight a dude and he throws a moon at you i hate it just i mean it's just like if you're gonna be a, a total douchebag like that's that's the way to do it yeah like throw you know start small throw some comets You'll make your point. Yeah. yeah. I don't understand. I mean, why why you got to flex like that? Why can't you just like half flex, you know? Like, you know, show what you could do, but not like what you like what you can do, you know? Don't just go right to the end. You want to you want to start small, and work big. And he li- they don't they- he literally flexed when he did it. <laughs> he did. He did. That's right. He just that's it. And then he was like, see this moon? I'm going to put it under a disco ball so the light reflects on the disco ball. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, wow. I can't believe you brought that movie. <laughs> I mean, like I said, I'll, I'll, I will go back to that movie for a second and just say, I'll give it, give it some historical value, but that's it. That's all I'm giving it. That's it. I, I will give it a, a passing grade in that it's the, the best put together of those five movies, Mm -hmm. the most coherent. And uh, I even heard somebody say, and I I agree with them after they made their point that in all five of those movies, the character who has the biggest sort of growth and change is Michaela in movie one. And I, I, I agree a hundred percent. So transformers one, you're all right. You're not all right, but you're all right. Right. <laughs> uh, so speaking of all right, we're on the planet, uh, and Loki gets the, uh, the the portal thingy, the portal device. And do you believe it's broken? Ooh, good question. Because um, it was the screen said battery was low, uh, which I think is funny that these people, you know, right. they use Infinity Gems as paperweights. But oh man, I got to charge my battery. Uh, so. I'm. I never thought of that. I never thought of the fact that that might be a lie. But that's so. That's so Loki. That if the show was called That's So Loki, this would be the great. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's uh, I, in our in our social post later. That's what you need to put. You know that. That's so Loki. <laughs> uh, if the Family Channel still existed, it would be on there. Um, yeah, maybe he's, he's, uh, he's faking this whole thing and that it doesn't need power at all. And the, the fact that these two are both, uh, like master con artists, you know, 
uh, they're bullshitters trying to bullshit each other, they're going to end up uh, really causing a lot of trouble in that regard. And anybody who ends up in their wake, as we've seen here, is not going to fare very well. Uh, but that's a great point, dude. I didn't even think of that. And that might um, that might come into play going forward because when you have these kind of situations where you have two people who really don't like each other, but then eventually, after a lot of struggle, they start to bond and you think, cool, they're friends. Inevitably, what happens? Something always takes place where they're like, wait a minute, you lied or you did this and you did that. And then that friendship breaks apart again. So that could very well be what ends up happening uh, after, you know, a whole lot of bonding and travel uh, and, and God knows what else they're going to be doing because they're stuck there on, uh, on Lamentus 1. There might be some kind of issue where Loki's like, look, I, I, I wasn't entirely honest about the Tempad. And she's like, oh, you jack! And then they, they start fighting. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I like it. I like that theory. Um, but uh, before I get to my wonderful theory, uh, mm -hmm. we need to talk a little bit further. First of all, the train sequence uh, overall, just so much fun. Um, and and I have to bring up a good point. My wife, Isabella, she pointed out. Wait, 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 wait. Say that again. My wife, Isabella. Relish that my word. Wife. My wife, Isabella. Yeah. Yep. I'm relishing in it. I'm not a fan of relish, <laughs> but let me tell you, I'm relishing in it right now. Um, uh, she did. She did want to point out that this episode is very much about relationship building, mm -hmm. and I think that is the theme of this episode: is 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 how do you build trust? And so, what better way to do it as Loki, like for Loki, than be in an apocalypse situation? where the pressure of the situation forces them to work together um, and uh, and then building this kind of bond to 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 accomplish a, a goal because Loki is trying to understand what is her end game with the timekeepers why why is she working so hard to get to them and try to do like i guess kill them or ruin the timeline completely i don't know i don't know why like what is her purpose and which is what loki asks but also what's loki's plan here is his he's now he's a survivor so is it is it as simple as surviving hmm. well i think for him it is um but that's a good point because we don't really know what she wants she hasn't made that clear yet uh which mm -hmm. means she doesn't trust loki 100 percent yet which makes total sense but i mean i guess the only answer i can think of has to do with the big in my opinion the biggest revelation of this whole episode is the the bit of info she drops um i think when they're walking after they get off the train where she tells him that the tva is entirely comprised of variants and the timekeepers lied when they said that they they made, you know, all these things that they made. It was all a lie. So that if she has been living her whole life, however long that has been, um, believing in something that the timekeepers have said or expecting them to fulfill some kind of promise that they may have made. I'm doing air quotes on a podcast promise <laughs> that they have made. Um, and obviously that they will not follow through on. She has every right to be angry. So this could just be a case of some good old fashioned uh, anger and revenge. Just, just wanting to get back at these people who uh, maybe at one point she looked up to until she realized that they were not worth looking up to. I really like that. And and we're kind of getting to where I want where I want to be and talk about because there's uh, which will bring us to uh, an interesting question. Um, but yeah, so when the train fight scene happened and the whole train character development uh, it goes without mentioning, a lot of fans were really excited um, uh, about uh, a lot of fans were really happy about this, uh, especially um, 
uh, how do I how do I phrase this? Especially the director, because the director wanted to uh, really clarify that Loki is uh, a bisexual character. But I think what's interesting on top of this, and something that I'm happy as a fan to see, is the love interests. I, I do enjoy the love interest stories because the love stories also breed some of the best stories of all. Um, and so she mentions to Loki, is there a prince or, or sorry, is there a princess, maybe a prince? Um, and he goes and he responds a bit of both. Now, what I'm hoping for is that this is Enchantress because she loves Thor, but she can never be with him. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what I'm curious to see is I would like to see that she is kind of like, a loki a chantress is like a loki character in the sense that she was she was the adopted kid of odin and wanted and and was raised in the family and fell in love with the thor of that reality and just couldn't be with them um maybe she just like something something happens like a battle or something and he dies and she just goes nuts and finds out that it's all like a like inner pursuit of heartbreak finds out that it's a whole thing um uh, finds out that there's a whole time variance authority and you know different timelines and the whole nine yards so you know what would stop her from ever you know if if there is alternate realities and she can get to the timekeepers then wouldn't she want to find a reality where she can finally be with thor but only finding out that in every possible reality she never ends up with him. that could totally work man especially if you know they are it really feels like they're going down the enchantress road so mm -hmm. yes and it's funny you you bring it up like because this is something that i haven't thought of really until this episode but okay so loki has revealed that yes there have been there have been potential princesses and potential princes but none of them ever lasted long um so mm -hmm. we we learned that loki is bisexual in this episode but it's funny because he has always for the longest time come across very asexual like he just didn't really give a damn he had more important things to worry about than romance he was busy conquering and then i started having this sort of uh, i don't know if it's um like a mandela effect or or what but i distinctly remember maybe this is in thor 1 or in like an old comic i don't know where it's coming from but isn't there like some kind of thing where either Enchantress or Lady Sif back on Asgard, like they're always throwing themselves at Thor and Loki is jealous. And he's like, why isn't she throwing herself at me? I'm the clever one. I'm, I'm going to win her heart. Even if I have to put a spell on her and make her mind, like, isn't that, was that not a little thing hinted at in like Thor one or something where like he looks at Sif and he's like, Oh, you, there's, there's better people you could go for than my brutish brother. Am I making this up? I think you're. I think you're kind of piecing together multiple, uh, multi, uh, multiple references. Because in Thor, in Thor one, well, I think in no, in Thor two, Odin says, uh, you know, you could have anyone, especially what's right in front of you, and he points to Sif. Um, in Thor one, I think there was a commentary on that. I don't think there, that that Loki was involved. Um, but in Ultimate Alliance 1, oh boy, the Ultimate Alliance 1, Loki says to Enchantress, and I think he also says it in Earth's Mightiest Heroes, I don't know what you see in that ult. That's it. Yeah, when they're in mm -hmm. Doom's Castle and Ultimate Alliance. That, that's yes. where I'm thinking. Okay, yeah, because I guess that's always stuck with me because I that game is like almost 20 years now. Um, but that's always stuck in my head. And I've always had that in my head as like all the girls in Asgard want Thor because he's the hot man. He looks like Fabio. And then Loki has to be the little brother who doesn't have Thor's looks, who has to watch all these beautiful women throw themselves at Thor and be like, ah, oh, fine. Uh, so that version of Loki, I guess, has imprinted on me. And I've imprinted it in turn on Tom Hiddleston's Loki. So that's what's going on here. Mm -hmm. All right. We clear that up. Yeah, yeah. No, so, but what I think what I like about this Loki, though, is like you, I think that, you know, maybe he does. I think that it's possible he could love Thor. I, you know, just like, because he's always just trying to tease him and everything, right? So mm. that's, that's kind of a relationship you build off of. And he is adopted. So, you know, that stuff can work if you, if it wants to. Um, yeah, I mean, it just begs the question. I mean, who does Loki love and why? 
You know, that that's that's always the big question. Why? Why does he does he love this person? But yeah, I'm curious to see where that I'm curious to see where that goes, because I think love stories really open up a lot of doors in storytelling and really you can go some really you can go to some really emotional places, which really gives the characters a lot of depth. And I, I would like to see that. Um, and I love he does the song. Uh, he do, I don't know what song that is, but it looks really Norse like and uh, or it sounds really Norse Norwegian. Did you get uh, some Norse. like heavy Return of the King vibes of like Pippin yeah. singing to mm-hmm. Boromir's dad? Yeah, that's that's all I kept thinking. Yeah, you're right. It sounded so of that era, of that ancient yes. era. Uh, I'd be really curious to know what the lyrics were and what they mean. And he seems to mm-hmm. specifically say them to her almost like he was trying to cast a spell while he was singing. So when when he quickly reverts mm-hmm. back to his barroom song and then she walks up to him and he's a little bit drunk or as he says, a little bit full, uh, I don't think he's being honest there either. I think he's totally in control of what's going on. All his inhibitions are intact. Mm-hmm. And he specifically targeted her with that song for some kind of purpose. I don't know. I I think Loki's very much in control of the, any I think anytime he's outside of the TVA, he he's very much in control of the situation because that's Loki. He's you know, that's the, that's the whole theme of the first episode was that it it why does he love hurting people? Because it helps promote the illusion of control. And I assume as a master of mischief, um, he always has to be in control, like no matter what it takes. Uh, and that's that's both scary for him, but it's scary for other people. But in this case, I, I, he seems so relaxed about everything, like as if, if everything's supposed to be happening the way it's supposed to. Um, which we're getting, we're getting to my big question. We're getting there, guys. We're getting there, and I, I have to. I want to get through some parts of this episode to get to that point. We're we're really j- making leaps and bounds here, so just bear with me. So the they fall out of the train and they they make a walk for the town. Um, I the battery low thing. I do think that the battery was low on the device because you know you got to power these things. Things have to be. In, in the rules of Marvel, things have to have to be powered by something. Flight can't just happen. You have to propel yourself in a way. Um, so, you know, there, there's reasons for everything. Do I think the device is broken? I don't know. It just seems to... I don't think... I'm betting that it's not. I think that he's he needs this to help move his trust further with Enchantress. Because one thing I noticed in the end of the second episode was she says he's superior. She's the superior one. And he gets offended by that. And I think he's going to, he, this whole thing he's doing is going to one up her is just to, just to prove he can one up her. And, and he wants to be part of her plan because she seems to have a better, a better outlook on how the events are unfolding. But he knows she can't do it. So he's trying to outdo her. So she will include him and then he can get all the information he needs. So do I think the device is broken? No. Do I think the device is out of power? Yes. Yes, I do. And so we get to the town and here's one thing I wanted to text you and say, but it's better I say it to you here. Does that not look like that 80s graffiti movie, that background backdrop that we always love in, you know, that love in movies? Because I feel like it was. I feel like it was the best, one of the best sets I've ever seen in a long time. You know what, sir? I will see your 80s graffiti movie and raise you one other thing that also reminds me of the two of us. Is it, it looked like an 80s graffiti movie and it looked like Laser Quest. (laughs) <laughs> it did it really did i mean we saw a lot of pinks purples neon uh first of all i love to see the neon mm. i mean give me give me all the neon you possibly can but i love the smoke kind of the the fog um there's a shot the way it looks uh there's a building with these eyes yeah uh right for a quick second from a certain angle it looked like galactus's head Ooh. But the eyes were more feminine, but still it looked like Galact- like the shape of Galactus, wow. um, which I thought was pretty interesting. But I mean, that's just my maybe my eyes and my brain trying to 
piece it all together. And see, I, but I saw I, a different thing with the eyes, actually. I saw, um, to me, they looked like the eyes um, from Avengers. I think it's Avengers issue one or Thor issue one. When you see Loki's eyes just in the sky watching what's going on, it looked oh, like those. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that too. Um, yeah, I mean, in the end, though, love the set. I will also say when the train fight scene went down in the trailer, I actually thought that would have been a Kang ship because they're, they're very kind of disc like shaped and the windows are diamond shaped. So I thought that was kind of like, uh, in the trailer, I thought that was Kang ship, but it turned out to be a train car. And the soldiers also, to me, almost look like Kang troops, but again, they don't. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight that in the scene. So I think at this point, we've pretty much covered everything in the trailer. So the next, the next three episodes, we're kind of in new territory. I don't think there's anything left in the trailers for us to see um, that will allude to anything else. Uh, Good. but, uh, going back to this final set. So are you ready to really get into some interesting stuff? Cause I'm ready to take us there. I think I am. I, I just have one more note about this final scene, this, this really fun one that, uh, we mm -hmm. have them running through here fighting and ending with this rocket blowing up. Uh, basically what I have is a question, Ryan, and it's not even necessarily a question for you. It's a question for the human mm -hmm. race in general. <laughs> okay. And my question is <laughs> guys, humans, come here, huddle up. Yeah. Why the hell aren't we building things that look as cool as this city or as the Grandmaster's planet from Ragnarok or as uh, Chronopolis? What's wrong with us? Why do our cities look so boring? What are we doing with like our lives? Yeah, why does it look so conventional, you know? <laughs> Where is the giant orange orb that towers over every skyscraper? Where is all that? Where are the neon eyeball? What is wrong with us? Why are we so dull? Start making cities look like science fiction. Just do it. Yeah. Just do it. Nobody is going to complain. And the people who do are boring. You don't want their opinion. You've seen what they cheer for. Their booze should mean nothing to you. Build to your heart's content. Now I'm ready. Dive in, sir. I mean, I don't know where you go after that, personally. Hmm. It's just, it looked yeah. incredible. That's what it did. everything should look it like. It did. It did. It did. So, all right. So let's get into, let's ponder the question, my friend. Let's ponder the question, what if? Ooh. So, um, you know, because every choice is not just, every choice is not one direction here. It's a prism of possibilities is what it is, right? It's a whole spectrum. I love that term, prism of possibilities. Love it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so in this event, this chaotic event, I really feel like Loki is in control. And I've been, I've been saying this earlier because we get to this apocalyptic scene. They have to get to the ship. The ship doesn't take off. They know that for a fact, or at least Sylvie does. She says the ship doesn't work. That's why whatever we do here, yada, yada, yada. So as they make a break for the ship, the, t the building starts to fall on top of them. And Loki says, I got it, does his thing, and then puts it back up. Now, they get to the ship, and the ship gets hit by a meteor. Boom, bang, pow, and there's no hope. And what interests me here is, like Isabella said, this is a journey of character relationship building. This is one of those things they would not spend too much time on in the movies. You would literally just get to the point where they have to become, they have to build this bond together. But this entire episode is one big bond, like relationship bonding session. And with that being said, I think Loki has the time stone. Hmm. Here's why. Where in his powers ever have you seen him 
rewind a building, much like we've seen in Doctor Strange, rewind it back to its state, and, you know, and then be able to go back and pretend as if nothing happened. And second of all, we didn't see him use green powers. Every time he shoots or does something, there's a green flash. When he rewinds the building, there is no green flash whatsoever. Interesting. So, what if this is an entire elaborate scheme to get her to trust Loki to find out why she's after the timekeepers. Huh. Okay. Now, what makes me say that, and I did my research before this very episode that we are recording right now. If you watch the first episode when he discovers that the Infinity Stones are used as paperweights, he picks up and I double check, people. I doubled and triple check. So before you question me, you watch the footage. I can even put it in here if you if you want. Um, he picks up the tesseract in one hand, and he picks up the time stone in the other. Now, here's where it gets interesting. When the scene finishes, he stands up, and you hear him drop. One. Hmm. Wow. Okay. And it's and it's a it's a kerplunk. Like it's a it's a kerplunk. It's not like a dink. It's a kerplunk, which would tell me that he dropped the tesseract because that's a bigger object. So right. it's gonna make a bigger sound. You're like that sounds like a cube falling over. Yeah. yeah. And it, exactly, exactly. I know my kerplunks, and let me tell you that kerplunk is a cube. It's it's definitely not a, It's not the stone. Here's the other thing is if you watch his hand, he never opens his fist. It's always closed, and he puts it, and he puts it near his, his waist. Ooh. So, all right. Because that's interesting, because with the building, I didn't even realize that he had rewound the building. I thought he was just like, oh, no, I'm going to just telekinetically put it out of my way. But he he rewound it, huh? He put it right back up as if it were like, as if he reversed the whole thing. Wow. And when Doctor Strange does that, there's no green flash of any kind when he uses it? No, when Doctor Strange did it, there was a green band around his arm, uh -huh. uh, a green band around his arms. But Loki, but two two things. One... Uh, Doctor Strange, when he used the time stone once, um, he hit it and then he like picked it out of the sky and you never saw him use, like you never saw any magic indication of him using it. Loki, on the other hand, he can disguise his magic, right? Because he can hide the daggers, he can make things appear and disappear. So what's not to say that it's cloaked and you don't see him using it mm. and he just gestures. He just, he makes a performance that he, he did it himself, but he's actually using the time stone. You're right. Cause they made a, a big to do about those daggers. They just kept popping up and he's like, Ooh, look, I got a dagger and now I don't. Mm -hmm. And, but, but there's also mention of that with the, the time device, with the time dev. Yes. She goes, Oh, you're not hi Are you not hiding it? Right. Yeah. Okay. So he's hiding. He's allegedly hiding this time stone on his person to use it just as a training exercise to see if he can uh, trust um, Enchantress or Sylvie, okay. or even or even just get to the bottom of whatever's going on. Yeah. Okay. Um, if that's the case, Ryan. Do you think this is all part of Mobius's plan that he and Mobius talked about doing that beforehand? So Mobius knew she was going to pop up in the store, open the portal. And he's like, you go in the portal and I'll pretend that I'm upset. I don't know that the Mobius factor of this whole thing. I have no idea. And I'll tell you why I don't know what his motives are. Here's the thing. Here's what we do know people. Ladies and gentlemen, listening to this podcast, here's what we know in the show. One, 
is that we were told, and Fantasia was right about this, they're bureaucrats. They're telling their perspective of the story. Uh, and and history is, is being written by the winners here. Now, what we're told is that the time, the time variant authorities were created to, to keep the sacred timeline. But now we know they're recruited. They're not created. So if Mobius was recruited, that means that why would he serve the time variance authority? Like, why would he just serve it out? Now, they are all their memories are erased and what have you. Maybe, in the, in the you know, what if he was the one sent to deal with Lady Loki, she freed his mind, and then he realized that, like, this whole thing's a lie and he needs to start fixing things. And so who does he get? But the, the, the one of the, he gets more Lokis involved. Yeah, I can see that being a thing. Because the, the whole thing, the whole bombshell they drop with the TVA is like, yeah, not only are they recruited, but they are all themselves variants. So if, if that is the case, you know, the official, um, sort of stance that the TVA takes. Again, I'm doing air quotes on a podcast. I'm so sorry. But, but the, <laughs> the quote unquote stance that we have been told that, the, you know, according to Miss Minutes video is that variants are bad because they cause a multiverse of madness. So our job is to clean that up so that there are no variants. But because everybody there is in fact a variant, that would stand to reason that the timekeepers, if they are, a really still there and be really still in charge they want a multiverse of madness and that might uh, add up because if kang can't have his renslayer because she's hurt maybe he's searching the multiverse for one like uh, kingpin and in into the spider-verse he, he loses his family so what does he do he tries to open portals because he knows there's another version of them out there somewhere uh, I think all of those pieces fit, man. I like where this is going. And I like that idea of the time stone. I'm, I'm giving it my stamp of approval. I like this a lot because it, it, it not only fits and it feels like mm -hmm. uh, it would be a good thing to push the story forward, but it just feels, again, like that's so Loki. Like that is totally yeah. something you would do. <laughs> There's, I, yeah. I think anybody who's a fan of this show and this character if you haven't already, you all need to read the Star Wars comic Dr. Afra, because she is a new character they made for the comics who is basically the Star Wars answer to Loki. And that she's not a good guy. She's not quite evil. And she just kind of gets by by being the smartest person in the room and conning people and, you know, grabbing things and being like, oh, well, I'm, I'm actually holding your gun now. Like, she, she, you know, a lot of that kind of thing. They'll do, uh, they did a whole scene where like this woman was showing her through this museum. And uh, when they get to the end of the museum, the woman's like, okay, so now I'm going to kill you. And Afro was like, well, actually you're not because, and then she explains this whole thing. And it wasn't like she had this mastermind plan. As she was walking through the museum, Dr. Afra saw a certain thing that was on exhibit and that thing made her realize, oh, you're the one who killed my mom because you have this this thing I saw in the museum that like she's making these things up as she goes. And if you look at, you know, what's being drawn on the page, you can see her noticing and reacting and coming up with the ideas in the same way that you saw Loki pick up something and then not quite put it down. Um, I, I really think you would dig this comic. And I think that this adds up for show. Sure. Sounds good, man. Yeah, it sounds. I mean, I always like these kind of uh, questionable characters, like where you see them do heroic acts, but you're never quite sure of their motivations. And I think that's the real question here. What is, what is the motivations here? What is Mobius's motivation? He seems, he seems like it's to me. I really feel like the next episode is going to be mostly about Mobius. I really feel the next episode is going to be spent on Mobius and then near the end or somewhere in the middle, they're going to drop the, uh, the, that Loki was playing Sylvie the whole time. Yeah. 
and then episode five and six are you know the 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 resolution of the conflict we still haven't we still haven't seen who the boss is yet we don't really know who the villain is here yet right and it could be enchantress but there's there's still a lot of room for um what's a good analog for this my initial thought was to say like this show's version of batrock the leaper but that's that doesn't Mm -hmm. uh that's not quite what i'm looking for I'd say there's still a potential for if this is Guardians of the Galaxy and Enchantress is Ronin, there's still potential for a Thanos. I think that's the best analog for it. Uh, there's still potential that's for somebody true. to be like, ooh, this is an even bigger deal. But we'll, we'll get to it down the road. If that's true, then I would love to see Kang in this. And Kang reveal at some point, even if it's a turn of the chair or a uh, standing standing there, you know, arms wide open kind of thing. Would like to see that. What if he um, was singing the actual song, I believe, Three Doors Down, with arms wide open? Would that make you more excited or less excited? Uh, less excited. <laughs> Not a fan of that song. Uh, but, uh, like, we don't understand Mobius's motivation here in terms of, he was sent to capture a Loki. That's what he was. He, that's what he was sent to do. So he thought the best way to do it was to send another Loki. Now, I do believe he does have another hand in this, in the sense of like maybe he's making this Loki a good Loki because he saw the potential of the other Loki, and and he wants to you know give this Loki a second chance at being the hero kind of thing. Right. Um, and. I think that through that, maybe this Loki, this Loki, may recruit Enchantress to for whatever ends they might be getting into. But my other question is, what like what about Renslayer? Yeah, that's the thing. Nova Renslayer. Well, she's I so that... in the like. You could have made that character anybody. The fact that they made it the crucial focal point of King the Conqueror's story is not by accident. So she has to um, kind of carry, she carries that weight with her just by existing in this show. So even if this show, we don't even hear a whisper of Kang's name, she has to make an impact here to us as the viewer and to the people in the back of the theater watching this so that later down the road, when Kang is like, Ooh, you, you hurt my lady that I like. We feel upset too, because we like her because we have had this chance to get to know her. Yeah, I see that. I see that. I don't know. I don't know. I like where it's going. What I, I think what we're trying to get at here, my friend, is we we need to get we want to see who the real villain is here. We want to see who the real villain is and why. And I definitely, I personally don't think Sylvie's the real villain. I think Sylvie's uh, a, a means to an end kind of thing. Like she's she's definitely has her journey, and Loki has his. I think Loki's the the antihero of the story. In the sense that he is going to do something good, but just so he can be him, like he can save himself. Mm-hmm. Well, but I'm... what I want, what I want to see though, still, I want to see Kang. I want to see yeah. Kang in this. I feel like you, I feel like you can't do this episode without Kang, or, or sorry, you can't do the series without Kang in some way, uh, past what we've already seen. Now, technically, we could argue that we have seen him in cartoon form already. And we've seen references to him, um, but I would I want to actually see him. Like I want to see him. Um, I also, I could use one more character surprise of some kind. I don't know who it is. Don't know why, but I want to see one character surprise. One more character surprise. Give me something, even if it's a cameo, even if it's uh, even if it's a possible character we might see in the future. Uh, kind of like, uh, kind of like uh, spec- uh, Spectre. Spectre, Spectrum, 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 Spectrum. Yeah, Spectrum. Give me something like that. I want to see. I want to see another character like that. It could be Enchantress, but I would like to see somebody else too. 
as well. Okay, that's fair. I can dig that. Um, so before we log off for the night, let me ask you this question, Ryan. Uh, let's play Never Tell Me the Odds. Okay. Love this game. If she is, if she does end up being Enchantress, and that's 100%, what are the odds she has at least a cameo in Love and Thunder? I mean, the word love is in the title, and she's Amora. <laughs> I will say, I like where your head's at, and I will say that is very much a possibility, especially with Thor looking the way he is. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, Damn. I would say, I'd say the odds are pretty high that uh, the odds are pretty high that she would be in. Love and Thunder. And I, I, I think that she's been very popular, actually. I think the audience is really loving this Sylvie character. So, well, I mean, she knows what this might mean for the actor. Yeah. She's, uh, she's only really had this episode uh, for us to get to know her, but she's already stolen the show. Almost literally. Uh, she's almost literally stolen the show. She rushed it. Yeah. So, yeah. I think I agree. I think the odds are pretty good. I'm going to say like it's a, a fair like 64% we see her in Love and Thunder. You know, if it's just for a bit. Um, remember, Gore is a god butcher. And it would help if there were some other gods around for him to butch. Because I think it's pretty safe to say he's not going to butch Thor. So, you know. Is he? I don't know. No, he's definitely not going to butch the mighty Thor. Because she's got to be around. Jane's got to stick around to kick some ass and take some names. Uh, I think, I think Jane will stick around. I I think Thor may survive, mm -hmm. but there is, a, there is the possibility that, you know, after, cause like he only has guardians essentially after this film, as far as we know, unless he's, unless Chris Hemsworth loves it so much that they just like gave him another six picture deal or maybe, whatever. maybe Sif is getting butched. Maybe she's the one that Gore takes out. That'll be sad. If Sif dies, but yeah, I uh, I think Enchantress coming in there, fair bet. Uh, wonderful, wonderful episode. Lamentous, beautiful title too. Beautiful set design again. We got this great new looking planet. Uh, please, architects of Earth, take note. Uh, and if you plan on building uh, some kind of space arc to get us away from a global catastrophe, please. Protect that arc from the elements until it's ready to launch. <laughs> or make more of them. Or make more. Yeah, that's a thing you can do too. Ryan, where can people find you uh, when you're not here on the podcast? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can find me over at Crusader Online and on, uh, on Twitter. And then on Twitch, you can find me at twitch.tv forward slash Xbox Canada. And you can find me on the Lamentous Train singing Norse hymns with Loki. And then on Instagram and Twitter at Andrew Fantasia. And on YouTube at Andrew Fantasia where I will be doing, uh, I have an upcoming video. Uh, well, I'll talk about it on our next podcast because it'll be coming out sooner to that. I keep forgetting June's not quite over yet. Uh, but yeah, that has been Infinity Rewatch, the third episode of Loki. Um, if I knew how to say have a marvelous day in whatever language Loki was singing in, I would. Maybe I'll try to learn for next time. But until then, Ryan, Sylvie, everybody else, architects, have a marvelous day. Hey, scumbags. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.